Hi everyone. Welcome to the presentation about the paper Universal Composition with Global Subroutines, Capturing Global Setup within Plain UC. My name is Christian and this is joint work with Ranka Netti, Julia Hesse, Björn Tuckmann and Vasily Stikas. This paper appears at the Theory of Cryptography Conference 2020 and this is the presentation uh, for this paper. The paper is about two major concepts in provable security. On one hand, we will talk about composable security, and on the other hand, we will talk about global subroutines or global setup. So let me start with the first concept uh, on this, namely global setup. Uh, roughly speaking, a global setup is, uh, is a setup that your protocol assumes is available, but you must assume that this, this setup is not just there for you. There might be other protocols accessing it and modifying its state. Let's consider a first example, global blockchain. Uh, assume you're program or you're designing a payment channel, a payment channel protocol, and you use which which enables a lot of off-chain transactions, but eventually you settle or you close the channel and uh, send transaction to, to a settlement layer to, for example, the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, at the same time, someone might be playing poker and pay out uh, rewards also via the Bitcoin blockchain. And in the future, maybe other protocols join, for example, fair exchange of digital goods or implementing atomic swaps. And all of them, they access the same Bitcoin blockchain and those transactions end up on the same chain. So these data coexist or a bit more technically speaking, all these protocol sessions, they actually share a certain state among each other. A second prominent example is the use of a PKI, of a public key infrastructure. In this simple example, a public key infrastructure is seen as the binding between an identity and public keys, which then could be used in a secure mail program uh, for, but as follows. If you, if you want to send an email, you encrypt it with the public key of the recipient that you look up in the PKI uh, repository, or if you receive an email, you want to verify a signature for which you need the verification key, the public verification key of the, of the sender. Of course, other programs might exist and your keys uh, are seen by anyone uh, if you use a publicly available PKI. And hence also this PKI must be considered a global setup, a setup that you uh, or a global subroutine that you invoke, but other parties, uh, sorry, other protocol sessions might invoke the very same uh, PKI infrastructure. The second important concept here is uh, composable security. In composable security, we roughly uh, speaking, speaking compared to worlds, the real world where the protocol is executed, there we model the, the real world network. We have an adversary that uh, attacks, uh, that corrupts parties, etc. And we compare this to an ideal world that um, uh, that formalizes the, the task of that the protocol should achieve in an idealized manner, for example, using specifying it as an ideal functionality. The ideal functionality might uh, say that, you know, you take the inputs of all parties and then you compute the function of it and you output uh, this result to all parties again. However, also, uh, it's also important that in the ideal world, in this ideal functionality, you also specify what the adversary can at most learn about, uh, for example, the party's inputs. You could learn that, uh, you could uh, specify that the adversary does not learn anything um, and uh, about the party's inputs, uh, which gives a, which gives the security, uh, which gives a feeling of security just by looking at the ideal functionality f. And intuitively, if no environment can tell the difference between the real and its idealized, between the real world and its idealized version, then obviously this protocol must be secure. And intuitively why this is composable is also because uh, you can also plug in this construction in an, another protocol. And also this protocol obviously cannot see a difference because here we uh, quantify over all environments. Let's be a bit more precise in terms of uh, a UC statement uh, and, and see here uh, the structure of, of such a statement. So we have the environment on the left set, it interacts, it bonds uh, one protocol session pi uh, we have an adversary interfering with the protocol execution 
And uh, in this example, we assume that the protocol works in the presence of a common reference string, uh, a CRS. CRS is typically used when you must assume the existence of a public key infrastructure or in the blockchain setting, you must have access to a Genesis block. <clears throat> Important thing here is that in standard UC, the CRS is local to your protocol session. This means the environment and hence also no external protocol can access it, read it or even influence it. In the ideal world, as I said before, we have the ideal functionality and uh, we have an ideal world attacker, which we call the simulator. So it's a simulation based security, uh, security framework. And um, what we require is that we might see here immediately that, okay, there, there might be no chance that, that pi and f, you know, they, they exactly look the same, right? f is idealized, pi sends a lot of messages. In order to make the transcripts indistinguishable, we allow that the simulate, simulator can uh, correct the, those differences. So the security notion is that a protocol pi securely realizes f, if for any real world attacker, there is a simulator that simulates all these actions uh, of the real world, such that the two views, the two transcripts are just indistinguishable. Put differently, this means that any real world attack can be translated to an attack in the ideal world, but the ideal world, as we know, is secure by definition. Hence, there can be no attack against the protocol either. Reflecting a bit more on these standard UC statements, I said before that the CRS is local to the, um, to the protocol session. And this also makes the simulation task easier. Why? Because the simulator could lie to the environment in the sense that it could create an indistinguishable version of the CRS, but some uh, a CRS with a backdoor inside. And we know all these tricks in the compulsory security literature uh, that yeah, are related to programming a certain setup assumption or uh, for example, the random oracle. You can only program the random oracle if it's also local to your, to your session. And in order to get closer or to close the gap between that in reality, the CRS is shared with everyone and in the model, uh, as we have seen so far, the CRS can be uh, considered local and the simulator can apply some tricks. In order to close this gap, to have a model that is closer to reality, Ganetti et al. at TCC 2007 introduced a, a framework called externalized UC and global UC. In a nutshell, the externalized UC would now allow access to the CRS by the environment and hence also by any other protocol that is running in the world. Uh, the notion then is, is, is similar. You must be indistinguishable from an ideal world. But here, the task of simulating becomes substantially harder. As you see, uh, here the simulator must cope with the, with the CRS um, as is. He cannot program it. The CRS might even pre-exist before the protocol session even started. So the challenge of a GUC statement or EUC statement is that the simulation in general needs to deal with the setup as it's defined and it cannot implant uh, anything a priori. Uh, and even worse, this, this global subroutine might be influenced by the environment directly and its state might be changing, uh, which is not under the control of the simulator. So you might ask, isn't GUC therefore already here? And as our work uh, reveals, there are some subtleties in the definition of the GUC framework. So uh, in a nutshell, GUC uh, defines that besides the challenge session pi, uh, other machines can be uh, created. So other machines can coexist that they might try to interfere with the challenge session or its subroutines. And what we saw is that uh, if the environment is really such, uh, in unconstrained in such a strong manner, then it's hard to prove security of protocols. For example, consider a, a simplified ideal world uh, where the environment interacts with, with an ideal functionality. And now consider the following in GUC, uh, Z could just spawn another protocol pi uh, with the same session ID and presumably there is no interference between f and pi if f is defined nicely as is typically the case. 
But now we switch to the real world and we insta uh, instantiate f with the protocol pi, then by doing the very same thing as before, there might be interference now. In particular, this session already exists uh, now and it's simply not clear what would happen. There might be interference. There might be, uh, the environment might realize that only one session is running and not two. Uh, so th this is all uh, a bit undefined. And this, tri this, this dirty trick has basically many phases. So there are a lot of these uh, uh, steps where things are a bit unclear, which could lead or which often lead to uh, uh, distinguishing attacks. And th those distinguishing attacks, more importantly, they have nothing to do with the protocol. It's just these are modeling attacks uh, without uh, a real world analog on, so to speak. A further complication is that while uh, G, so GUC is defined uh, as a new model on top of UC, and while UC progressed considerably, GUC would actually have to be uh, made up to speed. Otherwise, this mismatch between the two models becomes too big. and They're not maintained at the same speed, and so this causes some, uh, some mismatch. And um, as I said before, the, yeah, not all definitions in the GOC framework do actually uh, define exactly how the machines are created, how so governing aspects like the identities of protocols and so on. This is all a bit uh, uh, left left aside, and so it's actually the expectation that UC would actually give us all this. Uh, information and uh, so that that kind of asks for whether there is a better way uh, to do it closer to you see externalized you see on the other hand is a bit simpler so in some sense as you saw before um, in you see the environment um, yeah it can spawn only one protocol session and there is one dedicated machine via which you uh, share state with the world. It has similar complications because it lives as a subset of, uh, as it is a subset of GUC, it has a bit of the similar uh, problems. Uh, there is uh, a theorem that also establishes that when you prove something secure in EUC, then this implies GUC security of certain form. Intuitively, this would amount to show that uh, for this class of protocols, at least, um, the GUC environment, all, all, all actions of a GUC environment can actually be replicated by an EUC distinguishing uh, environment. And, and this seems also to be a bit hard without further assumptions that are not yet stated in that uh, theorem. For example, in GUC, you can spawn machines that you then can corrupt, which can interact with, uh, with the protocol. However, those machines do not even exist in EUC because in EUC, you can only spawn the test session. And so it's not clear what uh, what happens to the corruption. Uh, what happens to corruption? What how, how would you represent corrupted identities in this model? So I'm sure uh, this can be done, but a nicer way would be to to uh, answer the following question, which would get rid of all these uh, uh, issues, namely whether it's possible to model global behavior already in standard UC in order to to work in the same formalism. Then uh, we don't have to invent new uh, new uh, big concepts, we can just work along the lines of UC and inherit all basic definitions that this framework already gives us. And the answer is uh, yes, we can do that. And the answer is our paper. And the first attempt to, to approach this would be to say, well, if we are aiming at a security notion, at a composable notion that, uh, so we have pi and f and that they access the global subroutine, uh, why don't we just consider this as one protocol? So we merge G, uh, we, see, we, we see G as a protocol on its own that is called by Pi. So we just put both in parallel and say, this is a protocol that gives you access to Pi and gives you access to G. And then realizing uh, in the presence of a global subroutine would amount to saying, well, P with this, uh, Pi with this G, UC realizes F with this uh, G in parallel. However, uh, one shortcoming here is that we tie together uh, pi and g uh, very strictly. 
which means we cannot kind of spawn new global subroutines without necessarily spawning also protocol machines pi. So it does not really handle the dynamic creation of sessions of independent or almost independent session. The protocol and the global subroutine, they are st uh, stuck together, which is however fine if you work in frameworks that have a more static way of interacting that's fixed the set of machines that exist and also fix the ports or interfaces via which they can communicate. So for them, such a composition, such a, a com merging operation might uh, already solve, solve the problem. However, in UC, the spirit of UC is that machines can be dynamically uh, created. Uh, the identities need not be fixed. You could uh, determine the identity on the fly and then spawn such a new machine and address it in such a dynamic fashion. And for this, this uh, solution would be too strict. So we have to follow another approach. And this is, the, uh, this is what we then uh, uh, figured out. What we can do is the following. We can create, uh, design a standard UC protocol that we call the management protocol that ensures that we can create many sessions of the global subroutine and that the environment has access to these global subroutines. And we can design it in such a generic and oblivious way that it's a simply an overlay structure, it doesn't change any behavior, but it simply allows access uh, by any protocol to the global subroutine. It's probably easiest to think of this as a transformation. Take the protocol pi as defined, which presumably makes a subroutine calls to, uh, to a global subroutine G, and then our uh, management protocol is a transformation that converts this setting into a standard UC protocol, such that the environment can via mu, the management protocol, access pi and create instance of pi, and as well uh, create instances of G. Overall, the behavior that we have from before is not changed. We just changed who can access and who can spawn machines. Overall, um, this is uh, an oblivious overlay of the, of the protocol that we try to analyze. There is some freedom in designing this, this, uh, this management protocol. So the management protocol in a first uh, or uh, the, the major, the most important thing about managed protocol is that it's a conceptual, conceptual piece. Uh, it conceptually shows you how to uh, unify two things and still uh, have them in some sense decoupled. In our paper, we give one concrete uh, instantiation uh, of, of such a management protocol, uh, but we, we might consider also giving alternative versions. So the important thing is, is that it's conceptually uh, a reasonable uh, protocol or a conceptually reasonable approach and that it works. So the topology of a UCGS statement, universal composition with global subroutines, uh, they look now like this. Uh, we still have the environment and you can access pi and g, but it does so through this management protocol. And on the right hand side, we have the ideal world where again the environment accesses f and g also through the management protocol. And if both worlds are indistinguishable uh, following analogously the notation and the, state, the, the phrasing of, of standard UC, P, pi realizes F in the presence of global subroutine G if those worlds are indistinguishable. So in the remainder of this talk, I would uh, very briefly discuss some technical aspects or technical terms that you will find in the paper. Uh, I would also like to mention the main theorem and illustrate how it could be applied. So in order to, uh, to have our theorems uh, sound, we need some technical precondition about the global subroutine. The first thing, uh, which is also quite natural, is that we would like that the global subroutine interacts with the rest of the world only through its top level machine. Uh, and that there is no interference with the challenge protocol. For example, G and Pi don't share kind of behind the scenes a common, uh, a common subroutine. And that G only provides outputs to machines it knows such that it doesn't decide on its own to spawn new, new sessions. We call this uh, regularity. Luckily, so regularity is not just uh, kind of a natural uh, thing. 
it it's also used currently in the in the vast majority of the uh, externalized and global UC uh, literature. For example, registration commands to global setups are quite prominent. For example, in the global ledger or global clock setting, parties need to register to this setup in order to request the services. And uh, regarding regularity, I just note in passing that an interesting future work could be to find out whether regularity is indeed <clears throat> necessary. We know it's sufficient the way we define it in paper, but is it also necessary? That's, that's still an open question. <clears throat> the second um, uh, major concept in UC that many of you might be uh, familiar with is subroutine respecting. So if you look at a global view of different protocols executing, you will see that subroutine respecting actually implies that the only allowed communication between uh, two sessions is via the top level machines. Top level machines of a protocol, they act as the interface to the rest of the world and all, all subroutines of this session, they, they kind of, they are in this bubble of, of, the, of the session. We need to relax this a little bit so we say that the interaction as before is allowed, but in, on top of that, both sessions can also invoke top level instances uh, or top level machines of a global subroutine. And this is where those sessions, they could start sharing a state or even there is information flow from one session to the next. Coupled with regularity, this gives actually a very structured machine interaction, which helps us improving the composition theorem, but also it assists when you design protocols in having a clean dynamics, which, which helps in, in, uh, <clears throat> in the security proofs. So the main theorem of the paper is the composition theorem, which in its general form uh, means that for any context protocol raw, which also is allowed to access the global subroutine, Invocations of f can be replaced by its implementation pi if pi realizes f in the presence of global subroutine g in the UCGS sense. So how we go about to prove this, um, so per instance of this challenge protocol inside raw, we actually first insert the management protocol without changing the behavior. Since mu, the management protocol, is a standard UC protocol, we can now invoke the UC theorem as is in a black box way. Once we have done that, we can remove this uh, oblivious overlay structure that the management protocol gives us. And this results in uh, having uh, applied the composition operation. That's how the proof roughly works. And why it works is roughly speaking, uh, because of the following, if you have proven the precondition, if pi realizes f, the presence of a global subroutine, the management protocol kind of formalizes the most permissive uh, context. Uh, so any protocol raw or the environment uses or access g in a uh, at most, so or in a in a at least uh, a restricted sense. So this means. Uh, what we have proven with management is kind of most the most generous version, and any context protocol obviously is is less generous than this. And uh, formulating or defining this would be outside the scope of this of this presentation, but it relates to the concept of UC compliance, which we also define in the in our paper. How would you now use this uh, composition theorem? Uh, connecting to an example in the beginning of this talk, um, you would have, uh, for example, a secure mail program that you prove secure uh, in the sense that it realizes a fu an ideal functionality in the presence of a global PKI. And now you would have a context protocol where parties uh, happily using this, this uh, functionality. So now you can say, well, take the first thing as precondition and then apply the UCGS theorem. And this means that we can start replacing the ideal functionalities by the protocol that realizes it. And overall, we get the same security level when everybody is using the protocol and not the idealization of it, which is exactly what we uh, wanted to do. This brings me to the conclusion of this talk. So what did we do? We introduced a UC protocol called the management protocol, 
And uh, this management protocol allows to model global access to setups, uh, but within uh, while working in standard UC. It comes with a composition theorem, the UCGS theorem, and shows you how to replace protocols in the presence of a global setup. And I would like to take the chance to uh, advertise a follow-up work we're doing. Uh, so, so far we have focused uh, the attention on replacing um, a protocol by its idealization in the presence of one specific uh, global setup. However, there is a very, um, yeah, very tricky connected question to this. If you pay attention to the, or if you focus now your attention to the global setup, an interesting question is uh, whether you can replace this global setup by the protocol implementing it and preserving all security statements you have done before. This is actually a very tricky question and it does not always work, uh, work like this and it does not always go through. And our follow-up work gives you the conditions under which such a replacement of the global subroutine is sound and we also show examples when it is not sound. In this sense, stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your attention and see you at the conference. Thank you.